Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think I'm back here. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was anything I did or not, but I, I just uh, froze on my end, and then I left, and then it made me the host, and I was just trying to figure out what happened. Uh, no, no, it was my end. I'm pretty certain. Uh, I think I lost my internet connection there. Um, let me let me pick back up here. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I, yeah, I lost my internet connection, so I might have to either have two videos or I'll see if I can merge these back together here. But um, uh, anyway, uh, we'll real quick, um, if you don't mind me asking, I just wanted to check because for whatever reason. I can go to the um, GitHub repository, uh -huh. and it only shows um, 0, 0, 0, 001 and zero two for me. Um, oh, for assignment three. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're trying to start. So have, have you? Um, so, have you? What like I, I could probably share my screen if that would help at all. Um, sure. Just a second. Let me. Uh, let's go ahead and pause this. Uh, Okay, so um, let, me, let me continue on. I wanted to show a little bit about using the debugger here. I mean, um, I won't go into how you use a debugger to do stuff, but uh, at least try and show people that uh, it is available on there um, and times could be very useful to skill, to good skill to pick up. So normally what you'll see uh, for all the assignments, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm going to go back and change this a little bit, but the default configuration is to run the debug executable. Um, so there's actually two executables that are created on these assignments, a test and a debug. Um, uh, anyway, we can, go, we can go ahead and launch it. So, you know, basically, um, if, if you come up here and hit this button in the debug tag tab, it will um, um, launch a debug session here. Uh, you, have to, you have to hit the little green arrow there, whichever, whichever um, configuration is selected. So uh, we're actually running a, a debug session here. Um, and um, it's got the, the normal basic things that you can do in the GUI. So I can, you know, I can uh, step over, step into functions. I can restart the session. I can stop the running session. Over on the left, when you're running a session, you'll have um, uh, things. Um, I can show those real quickly here. Uh, but um, you know, you have your call stack and, and uh, all the variables that are in your local scope and stuff like that. Um, now, the, by default, the, the um, so all your tests are going to be in a, like a test dot something like for this previous assignment, most recent assignment, test large integer dot CPP has the unit test. But but the 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 default configuration for the debugger uh, actually uh, I can move that a little bit. Uh, actually runs uh, the, the debug um, executable. Um, and so there's another file called main.cpp. So that's the where the main function is, where the debugging will start, okay? So um, the normal way I do this, and I'll, I'll kind of show why, is, is um, so, so by default, though, the main function probably isn't doing much of anything for all these assignments. So, you know, if, if we come in here, I just hit the step over button. There, there's like an output statement, but it doesn't do anything else in main here. Um, and then it's kind of done here, that, that debug session is done here. So, um, So the way this was originally set up, like, like if you wanted to, to debug, there's like a comment here as an example. If you wanted to debug, let's say the two string function, you would you would have had to add code into the main.cpp to call it. So like if you seem to be having a bug, I'll just copy and paste this um, example here. If I if I if I was having a problem uh, with my two string function uh, with this in my unit test where the uh, digits for the large integer were, you know, these are in reverse order, right? So this is a 2,147, whatever, whatever that number is there. So, but if you put that code in there, whatever code you want to debug um, and rebuild it. So I'll just go ahead and do a control shift two. Um, so notice that since I modified main, the only thing that got rebuilt was the debug executable. Now, if we run a debug session, oh, um, you have to be careful here. I think I'm still running the old one. So let me make certain that's stopped. 
um, and then we'll launch a debug session. But but now it should launch it with the new executable that I just rebuilt, including this code, so we can step into the two string function and kind of look around what it's doing here. So I'll launch. So by default, uh, whatever your debug session is set up to, it should stop at the very first line in main of the main function that you're running. Um, so, so it actually stopped here. That's that's the location of the code. So you know I can step through this, step over, step over. And then I might want to go down here and like actually step into my two string function. Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll step into that F11 or step in. So now we're into the two string function in my large integer. And, and you know we could do your normal things like step over. Um, we could examine variables. Um, so for this point, although, yeah, I mean, um, this is using the GNU debugger. So you'll notice that uh, in our call stack, you know, we were in the main function, uh, main called to string. Now we're in the to string function. So that's what the call stack is here. Uh, we can see our local values of our variables. So, you know, our position is nine because we're, we're uh, in this example solution, we're iterating from uh, the, the number of digits, the maximum number down to zero. So we started off at position nine. Um, if you look at this, uh, you know, so, so since this is a member function, this is a pointer to all the member variables of the member function. So this number of digits is set to 10, the ID is one. The digit, if you, if you did this assignment or remember the assignment, I have to open up the header file here, but um, we declare the digit to be um, a, an integer pointer, but we're using dynamic memory allocation um, in this assignment to actually allocate a block or an array of values to our digit array. Um, but um, in this case, uh, if we're in the debugger here, back to this, um, you know, I still think it's, it's a pointer to an integer, so a pointer to a single integer. Um, so you'll see that uh, in the output, it only displays actually the last, um, or, or actually the, the digit at position zero. Um, um, so if I go back to my, or my main function here, again, as usual, I got too much, I can't see everything. So, um, you know, when, when we, allocated the, the digits array that I'm debugging here, um, you know, the, the value at index zero was an eight, uh, the value at index one was a four and so on. So, um, I guess I'm mostly, you know, as a final thing here, I don't want to get into kind of using the debugger, but, um, you know, so there are some annoyances. If, if you want to, um, that, that we're using the, the, the full GNU debugger, GDB, uh, for debugging sessions here. So it's really a powerful debugger. It does a lot more than the basic things you can do in the GUI. Um, um, so for example, if you find your debug console here, you can actually, if, if you look up doing like debugging with GDB, you can use the normal command line stuff. So in particular, I just show you real quickly, like if I wanted to print, um, my digit array uh, index zero, I could do something like that. Unfortunately, when you're using the, the GNU debug command line, you have to prepend everything with the dot exec. So normally you don't have to do this. Normally in a GNU debugger succession, I would just say print whatever, but inside of Visual Studio Code, you have to do this dash exec in order to exec um, GDB um, commands. So that would, that would, for example, print the value in my digit array at index zero, um, my, my value at um, index um, one was, um, was a, a four here. Just having a problem seeing things because there's too much stuff on here, right? The, the value at index one was a four. Um, the value index two is a six and so on. But uh, you can do the full um, um, set of um, GDB commands. So for example, if I wanted to print out 
uh, like a pointer like this, but it's actually a, um, um, a pointer to a block of memory in the GNU debugger. I do something like this, say dereference the digit pointer and then say, show me the 10 values, which basically should be the full array of values of, of my digits array, 8463, whatever, right? So, um, okay, so I'm, you know, I just wanted to mention, I mean, you can use the, the basics of the debugger, or you can actually use the full, you know, it's, it's worth learning a little bit, you know, kind of the full power of a, of a real debugger like GDB here to be able to do stuff. Um, um, but let me stop this session here. Uh, but the other thing is, is you can actually debug the test, the unit tests. It's a little bit, um, I, I think I originally set up this, uh, the, the default to, to this, this other executable, uh, because it's a little bit messy to try and debug things using the, the unit tests. Uh, but I'll, show, I'll go ahead and show you how to do that if you want to. So um, if, if you select in the debug to add a configuration. So like I said, you'll normally just have the single configuration for launching the that debug executable. But you can actually add a, a second configuration. You could just change this, this configuration to, to launch the test instead. But um, I'm just going to add um, a second configuration. I have to be a little bit careful here. So um, this first configuration goes from this open curly braces to this closed one. So just copy that. Um, and I'm going to add like a second one, which basically does all the same things. But instead of launching the debug executable, I'll change it to launch the test executable. But yeah, so now if, if I do that and save this, um, I'll have a second debug um, configuration that I can launch here that runs the test, the unit test executable if, if you want to, right? Everything else should be the same. Um, I think you might not see these. Oh yeah, I guess you it picked it up right away there. So now you can see I've got the, the debug launch and the test launch. So, so if you select the test launch um, and launch a debug session, what you'll see is, uh, so we're running a debug session. It's actually running the unit test from like the, the large engineer.cpp file here. Uh, but um, um, the, the, there's a dummy. So, so since we're using this catch two unit test framework, there's a dummy main function. That's, that's the first play, place it stops. But yeah, if you want to debug your tests in like the large engineer.cpp, um, you'd need to do something like, like I'll set a breakpoint. Uh, at, at my very first test case, right? So let's say I wanted to, to debug things from here. So, so you can set, the easy way to set breakpoints is by clicking over in the, the gutter here. Um, so if I want a breakpoint here at line 33, um, and, and down here is all my breakpoints in my current debug session. Let me just go ahead and close off, delete all these um, breakpoints here. Um, so I'll go back and do that again. So, you know, I'll, I'll set a breakpoint here. Um, I'm actually um, in my catch main function here. But so if I can, since I set that breakpoint now on my first unit test, I can safely uh, do a continue. And now I'll continue and then I'll come down to that breakpoint that I just set, right? So now I can do things like um, step over. So, so yeah, if I, if I was having, a, if, if this check here was was failing, um, this, is, this is part of the messiness that I'm talking about here. So you might not get exactly what you're expecting if you try to step in here, because it's probably going to end up stepping into the unit test framework for this check function here. So let me just show you that. Um, so, so if you're trying to step in here, you're down here, yeah, in kind of the, the catch framework. So what I would probably normally do is if I want to debug my two string function, um, I would go over into large engineer.cpp um, and set a breakpoint on my two-string function um, and then do a continue from there. So that should um, continue down until we get to where actually into my two-string function where I can step through that. So now, now if we're looking at that, um, you know, basically we were in the catch two frameworks main function, which called all these member functions. Um, and then till we finally got to two string uh, where I have this other breakpoint break point and two string, okay. Uh, but we're basically, 
yeah, we're basically running my my call on two string uh, for this large integer, which should have the values one, two, three, four, five in the digits. Yeah, right. So again, I use that little trick here. So if we step over stuff here, um, so I could do my normal things to step through and step over stuff, but um, um, you know, again, I can't really see. Um, if you open up this object, you, you know the number of digits is five as we were expecting because because we're, we're stepping through here where we had five digits. Um, but I can't really see all the digits, unfortunately, unless again, I um, resort to the um, um, the uh, the GNU, oops, the GNU debugger here. Um, So yeah, I had, to, I had to get my my console thing back up to go back to, to the debug console there. So, but yeah, I should be basically in this point in the debugger and the debug console. So I can do the, the same thing I showed before, like print um, my digit array, print all five of the values in my digit array there. So. Um, 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 although, yeah, doesn't seem to be doing what I was expecting there, but you should be able to do that. Um, what am I doing wrong there? Uh, There we go, found it anyway. There we go, so I, uh, you know, something looks a little bit off, I'm not certain, but um, anyway. Uh, like I said, my, my purpose isn't really to kind of go through using a debugger effectively, you know, it's a good kind of thing to look up, do some tutorials on. I probably have some links in our class uh, about using GDB or using, or debug, how, you know, how do you first debugging, um, in general so uh but um yeah uh just keep that in mind um it can be a useful tool um so all right let's stop this session um so like i said i want to talk a little bit about the the recursion assignment but uh, let me just mention one or two things then about um the example about the uh, last assignment, the how you might have gone about implementing these. I won't talk about anything except for the final um, add function um, here. So let's close off a few things here. Um, oh, and like I mentioned in my announcement, if if people are interested in um, Looking at the example solutions, I can I can post uh, the code of these somewhere so that you can compare it with your own. So here's an example of add. Uh, so this is assuming that all of the um, um, previous uh, functions are implemented and working uh, for the previous task. So you know, like the max digits. So so, so you know what I wanted to point off point out and kind of show this example solution for, you know, some, some people, you know, got this far and, and uh, got it. Um, although, you know, some people use a, a different approach. Um, so uh, part of the reasons why these functions for the tasks were given uh, is so that you could do this implementation uh, in a rather complex, compact way here, right? So, so the general idea is that, you know, if, if, if we're passed in another large integer that we want to add to this large integer, uh, we're going to use the max. So the resulting large integer, if you're given just add, is going to be either the number of digits in the bigger of the number of digits of the two, either of this or the other, you know, so if I have five digits in this large integer and three digits in the other, my result is going to be five digits, right? 
Uh, although it is possible if I have five digits in both like this and the other, uh, when I add the most significant digit together, there'll be a carry of a one. So I might end up with actually six digits, right? So anyway, max digits, if it's working correctly, the way it was where you were supposed to implement it, uh, would give the, the maximum, the, the one with the bigger number of digits between this or the other. Um, and um, that, that either that number of digits or that number of digits plus one is going to be the number of new digits for my result of doing the add, right? So that, that was the logic of the max digits here, right? So given that, if you followed the algorithm described for this assignment, um, it was suggested that you dynamically create a, just an array, a regular array of digits, uh, perform the addition of the digits by hand, uh, and then use that resulting array to create a new large integer that, that would be returned as a result. Okay, so that's the general approach that we're um, showing here, and then that was given as the algorithm for the task six for the add function here. Right? So, um, um, so allocating the array. So uh, we allocate an array that's big enough to hold the digits maybe not quite big enough because you know we, we handle if there's a carry out out of the most significant uh after after the fact after we're done here so the loop then looks relatively um simple if you did it like this uh, although again some people weren't reusing the digit at position so if you don't reuse the digit at position you you're forced to have like an if statement um because you don't know whether you're past the end of the array for this or the other, right? But but again, the digit at position is supposed to return at zero. You know, so again, if I only have three digits in the other, uh, but I have five digits in this, you know, once I get to position four and five, uh, the other would actually be past the end of the array, but the digit at position would be returning zero instead of crashing the program by you know looking past the end of the, the digit array, right? If that makes sense. So by reusing the, the digit at position, um, you know, we start at position zero, which is the least significant digit. We add those two together uh, and, and carry starts initially at zero. So adding those together plus the carry from any previous addition gives us my new digit. Um, but as the people that got this correct, then most, most people got this part from the description. Um, you know, so the actual, the, the result of that might've been greater than 10, but if you div and mod by 10, so, so modding by 10, the remainder tells you what the digit is for this digit that we're calculating and dividing tells you whether there was a carry of one or not. Next, go to the next one, right? So that would be the digit for this position. And then we have to do that for all the positions, right? Um, and then after that, so, you know, some people didn't quite get this from the description. So it's not safe to, to like create a large integer statically like this. Um, although this would kind of work. So we're using the constructor, but but the difference between using new here or just declaring result like this, you could have done this and returned it, but what you're doing here uh, on the first case that I just typed out here, and this was you know part of the way dynamic memory allocation works. So, so this result is actually created on the stack. So it's created what's known as statically or created um, on the function call stack, right? So result, anything you create on the function call stack, like temporary variables inside of a function, they only live as long for, for the lifetime of the function. So this is a bit about function scope that we talked about in some of the lecture videos here. So what it means is that actually when this function returns, this this result here that I just put in here actually gets destroyed, right? So the destructor is called here um, and any memory allocated in this function, uh, if we're deleting it in the destructor, which, which we are doing for our large integers, gets destroyed here, which is not quite what you want. So, you know, if you return this, it's in general, it's not safe to return things um, by, um, by reference that you're creating uh, inside, uh, that you're creating statically inside of your function here, right? So, so this will actually cause your pro program to crash if you're trying to do something like that, right? So one possible solution is to do what was described here is to, to create 
the result to be returned um, on the heap. So instead of creating it on the function call stat statically, we use the new keyword, this creates on the heap. So this will be um, this, this large integer instance that we created dynamically here will, will be valid until we call delete explicitly on it, right? So anything you call that you create new using the new keyword on the function call heap uh, will stay on the heap until you explicitly delete it at some later point, which means that, again, if we return this as a result, um, it's there on the heap until somebody some at some point calls a delete on it, um, which to tell you the truth isn't a 100% solution for this here, but, but it works for the small assignment. So um, anyway, that, that was this, this was kind of what you needed to do to avoid memory correct corruption or um, crashes happening. You had to return this as a reference to a large integer. You had to dynamically create your result using a new that you're going to return. So it's created on the heap, and then you return that reference. So notice, since since result is a actually a pointer to a large integer, I have to dereference that. But that would actually return the reference um, that we want. Um, again, you would get a compile error if you try to return it like that, because this isn't a large integer. This is a pointer to a large integer. So it's um, um, that's not what we said we're returning from the function here. All right, so I should move on because I want to talk a little bit about the assignment. But, but yeah, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention for anybody that's interested in the previous assignment. So yeah, as a final thing, you know, you're supposed to have reused the append digit as well. So this, if there was a carry, if you implemented a pen digit correctly, um, it would um, expand the size of the result in this case. Uh, so so it would, would create a new array um, of one bigger size and, and add that new most significant digit to the uh, most significant, to, 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 to the digit array. So. No. Um, just to clarify, sure. so on that last line, you're returning the pointer, correct, instead of the large integer yeah. itself? So remember back to, you know, if you went through the lectures about using pointers and stuff, this is actually dereferencing the pointers. Whenever you dereference okay. the pointer, you get an actual, we get an actual large integer by dereferencing the pointer instead of a pointer to a large integer, right? So yeah, oh, okay. so yeah result is a pointer to a large integer, but by putting the star in front, we dereference um, and we get an actual large integer object that we're okay. yeah all right um so yeah let's let's go ahead and move on um but yeah there's a couple things um to keep in mind about the previous assignment um so i haven't accepted the assignment three yet but i'll go ahead and uh Kind of go through those steps again, like usual. So, so I want to start working on assignment four. So let's get the uh, classroom URL so we can accept the assignment. Um, the uh, the only reason why I copy and paste that instead of just clicking on it is because I want to actually accept it in my other browser here, where I'm logged into GitHub using my student account instead of my normal GitHub account. So, all right, we'll accept that. So we can get to our repository. I'm going to go ahead and close this assignment off. So we'll finish up the, um, the checklist to get started on the assignment. So we accepted it. Uh, let's clone the repository. Oops. Make certain that we clone the SSH this time. Put it into our sync subdirectory. Open it up. Um, And uh, do our configuration step, confirm that it builds, confirms that the IntelliSense and the code style formatter checker are working. So 
open it up in the terminal to configure it. Um, and um, I'll just real quickly check this building. With the control shift one, make clean, control shift two to make all. And control shift three to do our tests. And then quickly, as I've been showing you, I don't know, there might be a better way to do this, but you know, quick and dirty is just to type in some unformatted code and see if on save, at least it's being indented and spaces added and stuff like that. So usually if you're seeing it reformatting, probably the code style checker and formatter is being run on save as you need there. So, um, all right. So, so yeah, this assignment, uh, the assignment four for this class, or sorry, the uh, three for this class um, is um, on recursion. So there's six tasks, but, uh, but actually you're gonna be writing um, three functions where you write two versions of each function. So one where you do an iterative version um, and then a second function where you uh, write a recursive implementation, all right? So, um, Uh, oh, in this in this assignment, there were some tests already commented out for you, um, so that we're checking some things. Um, but we're going to start with implementing the um, uh, uncommenting and implementing the first test case here for the sum iterative function here. Um, so yeah, I should mention a few things. So, you know, since our last assignment was a little bit about classes and things, so you're gonna be writing regular functions here. So, so last week we were writing member functions of the large integer class. So we're back to just writing regular C functions instead of member functions, but all the functions you're writing are passing in uh, one of these list classes, okay? So let me just talk a little bit about that, give some background on this. Um, so this list class, you'll see here, you won't have to add any code for this class for, for this assignment, although later on you might be um, working with this list class and adding member functions to it. So the purpose of a list, it's, it's a defined as a class, but it's really kind of a wrapper just around an array of integers. So it's really just a list of integers, um, but with some extra things, you know, so, you know, so it's a user defined type so that we can have uh, lists, um, where it keeps track of the size. So we don't have to pass in the array of values and the number of values in that array. So we just pass in the list itself. But we have some other operators that we defined on the list. Um, and we're gonna later talk about operator overloading. But let me just show you real quickly how these work. There's a um, indexing operator defined um, and a comparison operator equal equals um, for these lists that you're gonna be using. So um, if that those look funny, you can go back and look at this first test case that was uncommon. These are testing that list test case. Um, so for example, you can create lists um, where you pass in an array of values like we did for our large integer. So here we create an instance of a list called L2. Um, and then you can use those member functions like get size. So, so this list has five integers. So if you ask the size, it will return five. But here's an example of using the indexing operator. So by overloading the indexing operator, you can actually essentially use a list like L2 as if it's a regular C uh, array, right? So, uh, so these lists, because of this um, indexing operator that we defined, operator open close square bracket, uh, oops, allows us to do things like say L2, the value to index zero, and that's a one. The value index one is a three and so on. Um, um, and this operator is actually defined um, so that you can do assignments. So, so it actually works on the left-hand side. So if you wanna change the value in a list from a one to a five, I can assign the value um, in L2 to be a five, right? Uh, but, you know, this indexing operator does, if you're interested, you know, I encourage you to go back and look at the implementation 
um, for, for example, for the operator uh, overload. We'll, we'll, you'll be doing some stuff with overloading, overloaded operators later on here. But basically, it, it does some defensive programming. So if you give it uh, an, uh, an index, so if you try to index this list for like a negative index or for an index that's bigger than the number of integers that are currently in the list, it'll actually throw an exception instead of uh, uh, doing, you know, going past the end of the array, you know, so it's it's protecting memory by checking that you don't try to give it an uh, illegal bounds here, a legal index. So um, you see that here, right? So, so again, the, this list L, uh, um, L2 actually has five values. So the valid indexes are from zero to four, um, since it has five values, five integers. So we expect that if you um, try and in access index five, which is beyond the, um, um, the, the legal indexes, it should throw a exception. Or if you try to access a negative index, it should throw an exception, all right? But anyway, you know, back to this, all the, the, the point of all this is that um, for this assignment, you can mostly think of these lists as arrays. You can treat them kind of like arrays. Just think of them as arrays, as a little bit safer versions of arrays. So arrays that will throw exceptions if you try to go beyond the end, beyond the bounds of the memory um, and do some other things, right? So, um, you know, yeah, I mean, they have a string up member functions so you can convert them into a string representation of the values in the array um, and they also have the double equals operator so you can compare so this is a, a thing that you can't normally do with regular arrays in c or c plus plus but for a list since we define overload the operator equal equal you can ask whether two lists have, are equal or not have the same values in them or not which you'll be using for the palindrome um, um, function for the assignment All right, anyway, um, for the, this fun, for this assignment, uh, for the, the, the first task, task one, task two, you're gonna be creating something that just sums up the values in a list, okay? So, so again, it might be easier to look at this one. So here, list two that we're passing in, the other two indexes say, sum up the values from index zero up to and including index nine of the list. So, so this list uh, called L2, has 10 values from index zero to nine. So presuma, presumably if you add three plus five plus seven plus nine minus three minus eight, you know, if you add those up, the result is 35, right? Somewhat easier if I asked it to sum up the values in list two from zero to zero. So again, these are inclusive, but that's basically how you sum up the values in a list of just a single value, right? So the sum of the values from index zero to index zero inclusive is a three. Right. So that's what you're, you're supposed to be doing for the sum iterative. And, and the sum recursive works exactly the same way, but you have to implement sum recursive using recursion instead of using iteration. All right. So um, after uncommenting my first test case, you know, if I if I do a, a clean and a build, um, it should be um, failing because, you know, we haven't defined or implemented some iterative yet. Um, so in this case, some iterative takes those three parameters, the, a list, uh, I think you're supposed to pass this in, this in as a constant reference to a list, if I remember the instructions here are the additional requirements, and then two integers, the indexes of the begin index and the end index that I want to sum up um, the, the sub portion of the list of values, right? So here, all, all your code for this assignment um, is going to be going into um, the librecursion header file and the librecursion.cpp file. So um, again, just to get you started on this, You know, the signature that's implied by, you know, these tests here are, it looks something like that. So the name is some, some iterative, um, and it takes three parameters. It takes um, um, a list as input, which will pass it in as a constant reference parameter. Um, it takes two other integers, which are a begin and end index, all right? Um, so we do that. 
oops, that comma there. <laughs> Um, and then um, when we, um, so by adding that in there, we should be able to compile um, and that will um, actually make the tests happy in terms of, you know, what does the signature look like for this function, but we won't be able to link everything together because we're trying to actually call it now um, and nobody's implemented that yet. So we can make a stub function, right? So again, this is supposed to be sum up the value. So um, I'll show you doing the stub function. Um, so the, the implementations for this library should go into librecursion.cpp. Um, um, oh, I did add a, add a wrinkle in this, I forgot. Um, I'm gonna ask you to actually create the um, function documentation here. So don't skip over the step. I will be pinging people that, that don't do this. So you can go back and look at previous assignments for the function documentation here. Uh, we're using a doc oxygen format here. So basically um, uh, we can go back and maybe look at, for example, the list uh, CPP file, for example, of, of the documentation. So basically you should start off with um, the, a brief description on the line with the two stars. So this is like a title for the documentation here. Um, So here we're gonna be summing the list using an iterative implementation. Um, and then there should be a description. So this would be kind of like the, um, um, uh, the commit messages, you know, we have a title um, using doc oxygen and then one or more sentences of longer description. So, um, so given a list and the begin and in, indexes of a sub portion of the list uh, sum up all of the integer values of the indicated portion of the list all right something like that uh, so this is the iterative implementation, meaning we will use a loop to sum up the indicated values, not recursion, all right? Um, and then for, uh, for this documentation, all the parameters that are input to the function should, should be documented with an at param tag using the stock oxygen here. Yeah, if you have a question, just go ahead and let me know. But um, in this case, um, we've got three parameters. You should, you should put the, the name of the parameters, so not the type, but the name. So we've got mm -hmm. the list, begin index, in index. And then again, you should have a sentence or more of description for these. So a list of integer values that we want to sum up um, some portion of. You can continue on the next line, you should uh, indent a little bit extra, like two spaces usually the next line. Um, you know, you should try to keep these lines to like 80 characters approximately for all code in this class. Um, so begin index, the begin, begin index inclusive of the portion of the list be summed up. Uh, and then um, also, you know, if you if it's a value returning function, you should have a return tag. Um, in this case, you should do the type that's being returned. The list is returned as our result. 
anyway, yeah, I mean, don't skip that. Um, you know, so again, this is this is standard kind of practice nowadays. Um, and maybe sometime I'll sh show more about you know using this um, uh, documentation. But basically, you know, for example, the IntelliSense, if you format this correctly, you notice that now hover. Uh, actually is pulling that documentation. So anywhere that I call some iterative, um, um, uh, if you have this in the correct doc oxygen format, it, it, it figures out your parameters and your return value and, and um, all that stuff, right? I might need the at breach tag to get, um, I was expecting, I was expecting the, uh, the, the title to be um, separated from the description, but anyway, yeah, it's it's kind of combining the title and the description here on the hover. But um, all right, and just to complete off this, uh, so uh, I'll only show the stub function for this one this time. Um, so we'll return zero. That should be enough to get it to compile and run. Try to do a clean build here, just to make sure everything's going well. So it, it compiles and runs the test, but uh, but yeah, we're always returning zero, so uh, so it's, um, it's failing the test. So. Um, yeah, in this case, hopefully, you know, uh, you know, once you get that far, uh, hopefully, it's, it's not too difficult to figure out how to implement this, right? So for the 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 iterative version, you, you're going to need a loop like a for loop that goes from the begin index to the end index, inclusive. Again, you know, I keep emphasizing that this is inclusive. Yeah, so if I go to nine, I need to be adding the value to index nine into my sum that's returned here. Um, but yeah, if you implement your loop correctly, you should be able to sum those values up um, and uh, return it. Oh, um, um, I probably did add in a wrinkle that uh, you should be doing some defensive programming of your own. So you should be throwing like a, a, the memory bounds exception. Let me, let me check if I... Um, uh, that, that, let me, I'll have to check on that. Uh, actually, because the, the list data type, um, throws an exception, already has the code in there to, to check if you're doing uh, an index that's beyond the bounds. Um, you might not have to do anything, uh, I can't remember, but but yeah, so this might end up just being thrown if your code tries to access index 10 of the list that you have, the, the list itself will throw that for you. I think that's the way that works there. So. Um, And then the recursive version has exactly the same function. And in fact, you know, the, the, it uses exactly the same test. If, if you compare the test for task two to task one, you'll see it's using all exactly the same tests, but you know, your sum recursive, you have to use recursion to implement it, right? So that was kind of the, the topic of this week. So in this case, uh, the implementation is that is the the base case is that um, if the begin index um, is less than the in index, um, you want to return like a zero, right? So or sorry, if, if the the in index is less than the begin index, you want to return a zero, right? So that's that's how we kind of implement how we indicate an empty list is being summed here, right? Um, or I guess you could have a second base case here. Uh, I think you'll need one explicitly for this, though. But you could also have a second base case that if begin equals end, you just return the value at the index indicated, right? So if begin and inde index are the same, I want to look up the value at index zero and return that as a result. Otherwise, as I'm sure is described in the assignment description, what you want to do is you want to add, so if I, if I have... If I call it from zero to nine, I want to take the value to index zero and add that to the result of recursively calling some recursive on index one to nine, right? So that's how you do the recursion. You do tail recursion here, right? So, so take um, index zero plus then recursively call some recursive on indexes one to 
in the index, right? Hopefully that makes sense um, after watching the lecture videos on recursion and things. So. Yeah, and you said for this one, there's the one required base case and maybe two? Uh, yeah, and you probably do it um, different ways, but uh, but yeah, I, I'm uh, looking, looking at the test here, you probably do have to have at least the base case that checks if uh, in index is greater than the beginning index is greater than end index or however you want to do that Boolean test, right? Uh, and then um, then it may or may not make sense that you need a second base case to check it if they're equal. It might just work if you just test that because if they're if you just have the, this base case, um, then if you come into here, what you would do is you would say add index zero plus and you would recursively call it on zero to one and so that yeah so like i'm saying that might not work though because instead what would happen since one is an invalid index you might end up causing a bounds exception so so yeah you might have to do both base cases here okay yeah so you do you try. just do the um one general case or do you need multiple because this is just adding uh, them right yeah there should be just one general recursive case i think right so the the general cases if it's not one of those two cases just take the index at begin index and add that to the result of calling some recursive on the in the begin index plus one to the in index. So, okay. Um, all right. So then three and four is to use to implement something to actually reverse the list in place so both of these are going to reverse the list so uh reverse iterative and reverse recursive so for example just looking at the um test three tests So if we have list like L3 of three values, one, two, three, and we call reverse iterative um, after the fact, um, L3 is still gonna have three values, but uh, they'll be in the order three, two, one. So that's what reverse should be doing. So um, I think this is described, there's, there's different approaches you could do for the iterative version, um, but um, one example is you start by swapping. So, so here, you would swap the values from index zero to index two, um, and then you would increase your begin index by one and decrease the end index by one, and keep doing that in a loop until begin and end index have overlapped, right? Um, or they're equal. So that's that's the most straightforward way to do this as a loop. So so maybe a while loop that just keeps executing as long as begin index is less than in index, right? And then so you swap begin and in index, uh, and then you add one to begin index and subtract one from in index. You just keep looping like that, um, which, which should work. So for example, if I have nine values, I would swap the one and the 10 and begin index and then we get incremented to index one and index in index to eight, so you swap the two and the nine and so on. Um, and then the easiest way to do this for the recursive version is, um, is again, you swap the begin and end index, but then you recursively call some recurse or reverse recursive um, on begin index plus one and in index minus one, right? And again, then the base case would be if begin and index are equal, or if the beginning uh, the beginning index is greater than the end index, so those would be your one or the two base cases, kind of the same as the sum um, recursive. Um, all right. And then the, the task five and six then is we're going to build a function to determine if a list is a palindrome. Okay? So palindromes are usually thought of as for strings or sentences, okay? But uh, here we define like a integer palindrome as something like this. So, so if the, the list forward and backwards or forward or the, and the reverse of the list are equal, there's a palindrome. So here values four um, should 
return true that it's a pound row because you know one two three four five four three it's the mirror of each other around there right so um for your iterative version um um, actually, your iterative version, uh, you're not, you're going to be reusing um, the uh, uh, reverse um, iterative. So, so as is described in the assignment, the way to implement is pound iterative is to um, um, create a new list, which is a copy of the list that you're given. So you, you need to use one of the, the constructors to do that. Uh, so there's a, there, there's a copy constructor defined. But you can, you can do it like that, right? So if I create mm -hmm. a, a new list, there's a copy of L4 and I just assign it L4. This will um, um, make a new list called copy of L4 and it will copy all the values from L4 to the copy of L4, right? And then if you reverse one of those, and then if you use the operator equals, that's your basic um, implementation for the is palindrome iterative here, right? So if the if the reverse um, is equal to the non-reverse one, is it's a palindrome. Um, if they're not equal, then they're not palindrome. I might be skipping over there. There might be one or two subtleties that you have to do on that, but um, that's the basic approach, I think, that we described here. Yeah, so make a copy of the list, reverse. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, we are still passing in, you know, the begin and end index. So really, all what we're asking is if the subportion of the list is a palindrome. So if, if the value, for example, from one to seven, you know, so, so we don't have to give beta index of zero and in index of um, nine you know, for this, or, or of eight for this list here, we can ask if a sub portion of the list is a pound round. But, um, but that's fine. So you should be able to, you know, make a copy of the list, um, um, reverse the sub portion of the list, using the reverse iterative. Uh, actually, like it says here, it doesn't really matter. If both of your reverse functions are working, you could use either one in the um, implementation of the is palindrome iterative. Um, and then the recursive version though, you know, again, you're gonna use actual recursion. So your, your implementation of this one is gonna look quite a bit different um, from what's described here. So um, to do a recursive implementation of, of checking if, if a list is a palindromic list, um, basically the base cases are that if the list is empty, um, then you return true, or if the list is size one, so if the beginning index is equal to in index, then the answer is true. That subportion of the list is a palindrome of itself. Otherwise, you check if, if the the value at the beginning index is equal to the value at the end index, then potentially it could be a palindrome. So, or another way to say that is if the begin index, the value at the beginning index is not equal to the value at end index, the, the answer must be false. They can't be palindromes. Otherwise, if they are equal, they're potential palindromes, but you need to recursively call is palindrome in recursive on begin plus one and n minus one from the begin and in index, right? To see if that sub portion inside is also a pound row. Um, all right, so that's a quick discussion of those, but um, um, any questions on that recursive assignment? I'll probably have questions later, but right now I feel like I just need to go try it for an hour or so and figure out what I need to know and what I already know. Right. Yep. Sounds good. So, um, yeah, I mean, and in general, for anybody that's watching this after the fact, you know, just send an email um, if you have questions and things, you know. So, um, I, again, as usual, I hope everybody is to the point now where they can get the, the, the first one. Uh, you know, even if you're really confused about recursion, the, the sum iterative um, um, 
should be, you know, you should be able to figure that out, you know, without too much difficulty. So, so, so get that one under the belt, get that first task and then see if you can figure out the recursion and stuff. So, um, all right. So yeah, I went longer than I wanted, but um, I'm going to go ahead and end that session here for today uh, and get this posted and, you know, keep the questions coming. I'll see you guys later then. All right. Thank you, Professor. Sure.